I'm Sophie Smani and you're welcome to another episode of the Fulbright Women's Podcast Season 1, where we bring to you the brightest women of Pakistan and share some of the amazing work that they're doing in their fields. Today, we have Bakhtawar Ali with us. Bakhtawar went to the Fletcher School at the Tufts University to get her master's in international business. And currently, she's working at Novartis in Pakistan. Today, we'll be talking about pursuing one's dream without having any fears and the importance of self-confidence. Let's welcome Bakhtawar. Hi, Bakhtawar. How are you? Good. How are you, Safia? I'm good. Thank you for doing this with me today. Um, and before we actually get into, you know, talking about the importance of self-confidence and having no fear in pursuing one's dreams, I kind of want to ask you, why did you choose Fulbright and how was that experience? Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for giving me this platform and I get to share my experience with you and a wider audience. And um, so just to give a bit of background to why I applied for Fulbright was that um, so as a business student, you, um, you know, study business, you, you have these domains where you are studying marketing, finance, supply chain. So you know where your career is headed and uh, you have a corporate ladder to follow. So I was doing the same, but then, um, you know, I worked for a multinational where I am implementing a digital platform and I felt that, you know, that platform is already, um, you know, been there, done that in another market and I'm just, you know, localizing it without thinking of, you know, how will it work for Pakistan and do we have ideas from, from, from our market as well or not. So what, what it uh, made me think was that, you know, we're always thinking about innovation from abroad. We're not thinking about, you know, do we have ideas of our own? Uh, and we don't keep ourselves at the center, I feel. We always want to look up to somebody from the West or somebody from the Far East, for instance, Korea, when we talk about innovation and digital technologies. So, I thought to myself that, you know, I want to do something about it, but how do I do it? Because I don't have any means of exposure or I don't have like the best practice learnings, like how, from where do I begin? So I thought to myself, okay, like, you know, I will apply for Fulbright in international business and I will do it in Boston, which is the hub of the startup ecosystem and learn something from there. And that's how I applied. So my whole case is that, you know, we always in Pakistan, we thought we think about growth in terms of, you know, we have made this amazing road or bridges. We talk a lot about hard infrastructure, but what we miss out is, you know, we are a population of 223 million people and majority of us are young. How do we, what do we do for them? You know, how do we invest in them? What about the soft infrastructure, like our education, our healthcare? So that kind of get missed out in this whole buzz of development. So I thought to myself, you know, I think we sh I should go there and, and find out, you know, how, how has that ecosystem worked and what can we do once we are back, um, you know, for yeah, this entire ecosystem, which is doing really well, but there's um, so much more that needs to be done for us. Uh, no, of course, I agree with you on that, you know, and it is a sorry state because a lot of us, you know, um, when we're applying for Fulbright, one of the re biggest reasons, among others, is that, you know, we yeah. want access to, you know, better schools and a better, you know, kind of an educational ecosystem where we can learn and grow and, you know, uh, work on our ideas, innovation, you know, creativity, all of that, right? So in that yeah. way as well, we are looking away from home to garner and, you know, train ourselves so that we can bring it back home and kind of, you know, work on it. You said something very interesting, and I want to carry on on that um, innovation, you know, that how we struggle with innovation from within, and we always have to, you know, look outside. Where do you think, Bhaktavar, this is stemming from? Um, I feel we lack the confidence sometimes that, you know, can we do it? And we don't see the bigger picture of things. I feel that, okay, if somebody has been there, done that, it will be easier and quicker to learn from, you know, rather than to do it ourselves from scratch. Because if we start to learn on our own, that will take a lot of time, but it is worth doing that for generations to come. 
um, um, for instance, you have this upcoming gadget from um, a, from a Western market, you're gonna just you know import it rather than you know the government or the key players thinking about okay, can we do this on our own? So we never think about that. Our our instinct is not that you know we can we do this on our own as well so that we can become self sufficient. And even though um, there can be any crisis or a problem you know facing a country, you know for instance we are right now in the middle of a climate change crisis, so technology and innovation can help us to do something about it. But what we end up doing is that we take innovation from other markets and we, we are not sure of, you know, whether that will work or not, but it's a quicker solution and it's convenient. But I feel that when you invest in your own people, when you invest in um, asking them, okay, what do you think will work? And what do you think will not work for our market? That really creates a, a whole different conversation, um, especially with the younger lot that wants to be heard, but we have to give them more platforms and the government, um, these key private players, research institutions, universities, they're all really important part of the ecosystem and they really need to give us that boost. So I was talking to my colleague the other day and um, I felt that, you know, in my business school, um, we were always told that, you know, we have to have a certain full-time job, right? There's this pressure to have a full-time job and there's this pressure of being employed rather than being the employer, right? But when you go abroad and you, you must have experienced this as well, there's a lot of encouragement from, um, you know, uh, universities abroad that, you know, you have to make something of your own while you're in your college. So there's this whole, um, you know, encouragement of making things just I know you're going to fail, but you know at least keep on trying to build and invent new things on your own. And that could apply to any industry as well. It doesn't need to be in tech, doesn't need to be in, in sciences. It can be it can be applied across different fields for that matter. So that that that's a, that's where I feel needs to be you know uh, worked on you know as as entire um, ecosystem rather than just just rely on one player of the ecosystem but also rely on several other players of the ecosystem yeah no that's true because what you said here is that it's not that our people are lazy right we find super hard working people who would not just go beyond nine to five really you know but that's happening for the others it is somewhere the you know issue with the mindset that we are not trained to think in a certain way as opposed to you know uh, the other what tools Bhaktavar, that you have been you know abroad trained and not you know have come back and feel passionately about this can you talk about some of the tools that can help people to kind of help them change this mindset begin to change this mindset yeah, so great question, Safiya. So um, when I was in Boston, um, I noticed this concept of, you know, innovation mindset in the way that there, there, there was a cafe called Venture Cafe. So, you know, every week you will have this hour where you kind of like matchmaking with investors um, and small business owners. So you get to meet your uh, business founder or co-founder over there. And then, you know, once you meet your co-founder or business founder, you can also just find your investor over there and exchange some business cards. So it's, it's like, you know, um, ideas is a form of currency over there where uh, they, there's no hesitance in sharing your own knowledge. It's, it's kind of like giving back to the society through ideas because in their mindset, when you give off ideas, it further refines your own idea. And, you know, in, in return, the person who is receiving the idea is going to pass this on to another person. And this is how like the whole community will have an incentive to exchange ideas. Because, you know, um, that's the thing that when you um, um, kind of give everyone that platform, um, on, on a very frequent basis where, for instance, you're having a free coding course or you're having a free filmmaking course, at least everyone is participating in that innovation mindset. And they, there is no barrier as to, you know, you have to pay a certain price or you have to belong to a certain university to be part of that meetup. You can just go to a cafe and instead of us just enjoying, you know, meals in, in a cafe, you can just also discuss ideas with complete strangers uh, with, with the intention that you're going to go back home with an idea and or you're going to refine your ideas. 
so that is the whole point of you know starting a platform or you know starting a, a, a kind of a community which is uh, not just confined to the social media but also is 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 an offline or is a cafe where you're bringing um, diverse mindsets and you're encouraging them to have a conversation with each other so that you know as a takeaway they can um, invent an idea or they can work towards it um, so that is something which was very common over there. And um, I feel the best thing was that there is the whole concept of all of the players involved. So you have the investors in that cafe, you have the small business owners in the cafe, there might be a professor of a university in that cafe. So there are different minds who are coming together just for an hour or so during the weekend whenever they get the spare time. And the whole concept is of, you know, walking away with an idea that they can get some money for and then they can get it going uh, with their colleagues. So that is something that I was extremely, um, you know, interested and intrigued to see as uh, an outsider. I think in the second uh, takeaway that I felt was that, you know, um, there needs to be a digital coalition in Pakistan. Over there, every player is working together. So for instance, the research universities, whether it be Harvard, MIT, Boston College, Tufts University, all of these universities are playing a role alongside with the mayor, um, who is himself encouraging innovation and technology for the city of Boston. And also there are, you know, these startup owners which are involved with all of these players while they are building out an idea. And then we also have incubation centers, which are around the campus and around the universities. So this is how they are making all of the players accessible to a normal student, which, you know, over here may not be accessible. If I want to go to the government to get to get a fund, then there is going to be a lot of paperwork. I may not know where is where do I need to get information because the in universities may not have a platform which can guide me directly to the government or directly to the incubation center. So everyone's working in silos over here, but over there I felt that everything was you know uh, kind of connected to each other. All of the players are together, and uh, the policy makers and uh, the government or uh, the state government is very much involved with what is happening with each of the players and where, they, where do they want to contribute? Like how they can bridge any gaps which are coming within the ecosystem. So I felt that it was a very vibrant ecosystem that way. And over here, um, I'm so glad that, you know, the VC uh, funding uh, area, um, you know, investments are coming in from not just local investors, but also global investors. But we also need to see what role can the government and what role can, you know, research institutes and universities can play in that area as well for, uh, you know, students and for young professionals who have an incentive to take the risk of leaving their full-time job, which is extremely important, obviously, and, you know, take that leap of faith to um, have their own business going, you know. So I think that confidence is missing, you know, which needs to be given by each player of the ecosystem. And third thing that I felt was that the government also needs to step up and um, have their own platform, you know, like give give some training to the citizens, like, you know, how to use the internet, like really basic digital skills training. And then yeah. the government can provide platforms, you know, this is one portal where you will do all your tax filing, you will do all your social security uh, services, you will know the status of your pension, everything has to be in just one platform. So that will encourage citizens of all ages to please get trained and then use those platforms. So I feel like a lot of role can be played by the government if private sector players are saying that, you know, government is doing this much. I think we should also do something of that sort. So if the government plays the role, then, you know, everybody else um, could follow as well. So I feel like these are the three important learnings that I felt I got by, while I was there. So we really talked about a lot of things. I want to go back to the cafe that you mentioned earlier on. So essentially what you're saying is that you know, what was happening there was that an environment was being built that would foster sharing of ideas and foster innovation, you know, foster confidence in each other, all of that. Now, if I compare that with, you know, the culture that we have here, uh, mostly, I'm not saying with everyone, 
But here people are scared. There's this fear of sharing your ideas because the fear is that the other person is going to steal the ideas, you know, because there's a dearth of opportunities in the minds of people that I have this one idea, I have to hold it and like, you know, keep it like hidden till I find that one magic person, you know, who's going to help me um, turn this into a reality or something. Till then, I'm not going to share it with others. Talk about this mindset and how can people who will be listening to us help them, you know, help themselves get out of this fear? Mm -hmm. So that's a great point, Safiya, because over there you have patents, you have, uh, you know, intellectual property laws over there, which are fully enforced. But over here, we still have a long way to go in that. But what I feel is that we can start with uh, places of our familiarities. For instance, if we are starting off a cafe, uh, we can't expect people to fully share their ideas. We can start off with a campus cafe, you know, like a like a. a uh, a venture cafe in inside of uh, any university campus we can start over there even then if people feel that you know their ideas may be disclosed you can at least um, do a basic understanding of the other person you can just talk roughly about you know the pain points which uh, are going to be addressed by your idea and you don't need to fully um, disclose the mechanics of the ideas and the same thing goes over there as well even then they know that not a lot of startup founders in in boston or in other parts of the world may apply for um, a utility patent may apply for an, for for patents they may not they, they may not afford to do so so what they do is just give a basic sketch of the pain points try to gauge the interest of the other person if they are actually interested in your idea are they interested to meet again or are they just seeking to know more about your idea and you know um, uh, see where the conversation is going so you have to be extremely smart about um, you know not giving off your idea in one meetup but just start to see the energy in the room and start to just say hi you don't need you just give your pitch who you are you know where you come from um you know uh, why are you here so it needs to be a very ice breaking session in the first two meetups and then when you become comfortable with the person you can start to gradually reveal the information if you feel that the person is coming from a common background or has an interest and you feel that you know if if it's a famous investor that has invested in xyz companies of your interest so i think you are you will be more comfortable in telling them the idea it really depends on what kind of person you are meeting and you know you will only find out fully once you meet them in two or three rounds um, but I feel it needs to begin somewhere where people are at least uh, comfortable in just uh, giving introduction, saying hi, and, you know, getting to know uh, where the other person is coming from. And I think that is how we, we can become comfortable in giving them even more information later on. Yeah. I want to talk about your professional journey. You're currently working at Novartis. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you talk about your professional focus at the moment? Yeah. So um, Novartis is a multinational working uh, in the healthcare space. So what I really want to do is kind of uh, build innovative platforms for healthcare professionals, especially in the time of COVID, where um, you know information is not at the fingertips of a lot of doctors before COVID. And uh, what I aim to do is create a platform, and I've already created. A digital platform whereby you know doctors can access uh, their medical information at the tip of their fingers um, especially in the light of COVID so what has happened during COVID is that a lot of doctors are uh, busy um, you know catering to COVID patients and uh, their urgent uh, uh, patients um, who uh, are in need of care during COVID and after COVID. So what happens is that the doctor loses the touch of updated information on how to treat their patients during COVID. So those kind of information can be available online and it's all about you know, teaching and, and, and making um, you know, these doctors learn on how to best utilize um, digital platforms so that they can remain up to date with the information and that information can help them to save lives of patients who, which have been affected by COVID. So that is mainly how I think about innovation at the center is that do something which um, can create the impact within the communities for years to come. And for me, again, that that, that is a, the basis of the ideas is the information. If you can 
provide doctors with a platform of ideas and information at their doorstep then you know you're encouraging those doctors to talk about that information with other doctors and kind of you know save patients lives so that is the kind of um, work that uh, really uh, makes me uh, you know have a rewarding experience at the end of the day and that is the whole point of scalable innovation for me something that you can do um across you know multiple doctors in pakistan at the same time so that so has been my please, center point of work right now yeah uh great so can you talk about some of the challenges that you have faced in developing this platform yeah so i think the major challenge was to convince all of uh the company stakeholders you know to um go for this platform because obviously or what what happens at times is that uh we are doing something for the first time we you know will it work will it not work so i think the major hurdle all always is to um really showcase okay you know our other markets have done something similar and they have had this much of success and you know if we implement it over here it's going to uh, result in this much of success so it's really about showing them you know the impact that this could create in other markets and you know this is if we implement it right now that's a great time and we are in a pandemic so the doctors are going to appreciate how we are uh, distributing the information of science in a very um, you know safe and digital manner so i think that is something that all companies in pakistan have adapted to they know that you know everything needs to be at the tip of their fingers because of the situation on ground and uh, i'm very lucky enough to be part of a company that was extremely quick to adapt um, along with other companies in pakistan so yeah uh that is great uh there's something that you said baktaver uh and that's going to help me segue into your you know personal development you you talked about a major hurdle that is sometimes you know just getting out of your comfort zone um yeah and i remember we've had this conversation in the past um do you want to talk about that you know and i kind of also see a pattern there uh where you know we're trying to find innovations from we're importing innovations as opposed to looking within and then a major hurdle is to get out of our comfort zone i know you want yeah. to talk about that within your personal you know development space yeah so i think it's it's very interesting to see how that went uh, hand in hand so when i when i went to the us i uh, used to i mean before coming to the us i was always influenced by what others are saying or what my family and relatives are saying but when i went to the us i was totally on my own so problem solving had to be done very independently uh, because you know your parents and uh, your your friends and your family members are very far away and uh, you have to think about a problem or a situation at hand on your own and that really gave me a sense of confidence in why i'm here is because you know if that that's the thing about homegrown innovation or innovation is that you know when you think from within when you have confidence in solving a problem on your own um that is the biggest achievement that you can do for yourself personally as as well as professionally so um for for instance you know i i give this example to people is that you know when i was um, seeing my female colleague who was opening up a jam jar um she couldn't open it because it was extremely tight and there was a male colleague at the side of her and she called uh, him up that you know can you open the jam jar for me so the male colleague was said you know i can open it but can you you know open it yourself just uh, try it a bit so she opened it and after a few seconds she was actually you know able to open that jam jar so it's all about the mindset that you're relying on the outside a lot of times because you're conditioned to rely on the outside but here when you try and at least live through the process you will see how many of the things that we miss out on life especially as a female because we think that you know we we are not experts at this or we are not good enough to do this and we don't want to uh, think it through because of the fear of failure as a female especially so we need to kind of you know have that confidence in ourselves that you know just try it out it's it's going to fail then it's fine but um at least you will have the confidence to take multiple advanced steps after those steps that you've taken so i feel that is something which kind of um also uh, came into me very personally that you know if i'm 
having a preferred meal or I'm having my own, um, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm traveling and I'm making my own itinerary. So I am deciding on my own and I'm the decision maker at the center. So now I finally know what I really like and not like in, in, in my meals because Previously, my family always used to cook it for me, and that is something that you can't really negotiate. So you you have you condition to like something and not like something, but when you go there and you're uh, basically choosing things on your own, you're choosing your travel plans on your own. You kind of look back and say, you know, actually, I this is this is actually my life, and this is what I really preferred and not preferred. And that discovery of you know again unlearning and relearning was something um, extremely re revolutionary for me. And that is something which will not come by being in your comfort zone, being with your friends and family. That will only come when you live on your own, when you detach yourself for a bit of a time and you start to explore what is it which you, know, you prefer in life? What are your values? I, I know there are family values, but what are your individual values and principles that you want to live by? And that makes you a very stronger person and actually an independent person um, when you're back. So I feel like that uh, personal journey has really uh, shed light on my professional journey is that I tell people to um, solve problems on your own, to come up with ideas of your own, because it's not just helping your communities, but it's empowering you to solve problems on your own that somebody else will do, but you have to have the courage and be bold enough to take it through on your own as well. So, yeah, That's right. Um, learn to depend on yourself, which is a skill, which is basically a mindset that is not really, you know, um, very common. Right. And once we learn to depend on ourselves, once we learn to look within, once we learn to communicate with ourselves, once we learn to respect and honor ourselves, magic can happen. I think essentially that's what you're saying, both in personal and professional spheres. Right. Yeah, um, for sure. One last question. And that could also be, you know, our parting message. Um, what is that next thing that you are thinking within your own, you know, self that may be scary what is that next thing that you know you're constantly telling yourself mm, no need to be scared let's just go ahead and try it I think it's a very tricky and a very good question I think um, I, I do talk about innovation and how all the players need to be um, you know side by side to encourage a startup innovation but um, you know, I myself want to uh, be a founder or a co-founder of uh, a tech company one day. But then again, for me, it is, you know, um, for instance, there's this phrase which says, you know, what would you do if you weren't afraid? So my fear is of failure when you're starting off your business from scratch. I think it's the fear of failure. And second thing is that, you know, the, the cost of making your own business from scratch? Are you going to spend less time with your family? Um, are you going to be too much self-centered into yourself and into your business? So there are multiple um, fears that one needs to address one by one while they're taking a leap of faith. So what I would do eventually in my future is that I will always ask myself, and I want to also convey this to a larger audience is that whenever you're taking this big step in life, you need to ask this question, you know, what would you do if you weren't afraid? Meaning that what would you do if you weren't afraid of uh, family expectations or what would you do if you weren't afraid of failure? So you have to jot down all of these fears one by one and then see if those fears are real and if they are real, what would you do about it in order to, uh, you know, start your own business or start your own venture? And then what if, what will that uh, jotting down of fears will do is that you will come up with, um, you know, solutions from your own and you need to figure it out that, you know, what are the solutions that you're going to come up with that will address those failures and that will help you to build a support system which can help you to, you know, um, start that company or, you know, uh, start any big task that you're doing in life. So for me, it's always going to be my screensaver one liner is that, you know, what would you do if you weren't afraid? And you, you would time and time again would have to take big steps in life. But if it's worth doing, um, you have to go ahead and uh, add it and, you know, kind of address your failures along the way, you know. That's, that's, that's beautiful because what I heard yeah. 
you know, if I have to summarize that, what I heard you saying is that one has to be, you know, one has to dare to be uncomfortable because only then you begin truly, you know, you truly begin to live after, you know, you become uncomfortable exactly. and dive into, you know, territory no, that you haven't uh, been with, in before. Yeah, and without any regrets in life because life is too short anyway. So you have to, you know, face your fears head on um, always in life. So that will be well, my, like take it. I'm going to wish you all the strength and all the confidence and uh, everything in your pursuits of just going at life, you know, with full force on and doing everything you want to do. And maybe one day, like we'll be talking again when you would have started your own tech company. And uh, <laughs> fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, till then, all the best with everything that you're doing because you're doing an amazing job. Thank you so much for finding time for this conversation. Today, you. you have a great day ahead.